Thank you, Jeff and Sue, for investing in her to prepare her to be a blessing to the church of the Lord Jesus in the years to come. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Philippians chapter 3. So we're thinking today about learning Christ or learning more of Christ, learning to be more like Christ. Look at verses 8 through 11 and stand with me if you would. And follow along in your Bibles, or if you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along on the screen to see this text. The Apostle Paul says to the church at Philippi, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends upon faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And as we're going through this series during this season, challenge to, to hear these bells ringing as we are physically hearing them all over town. But to latch on to the idea of the value of blessing others. Not looking to be blessed, blessing others. Of purposing to eat with someone to show them hospitality as a window to show them Jesus. sure to listen in the hustle and bustle and busyness of life and hyper busyness of this season to be sure and stop and listen to the Spirit to be led by Him and to learn Christ that we might be conformed to the image of Jesus and then next week to look at being sent because God sent Jesus to us may the Lord make us more sensitive to what's happening around us so that we can be more responsible to touch lives for Jesus' sake. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we've, we're going through this uh, series called Hear the Bells Ringing, and I want to uh, say to you, if you've got a bulletin today, I have uh, put, inserted in there a gift, and it's the gift of a poem that I wrote that ties into this series. And I hope you picked up a bulletin. If you didn't, there, there are more out there, I'm sure, and you can grab this on the way out. But I want to read this to you if, you, if you don't mind. Entitled the poem, When You Hear the Bells Ringing This Christmas. When you hear the bells ringing this Christmas, remember to stop and to bless someone who could use a kind gesture that would help them to handle life's stress. When you hear the bells ringing this Christmas, purpose to take time to eat with someone who might see this kindness as an action incredibly sweet. When you hear the bells ringing this Christmas, be sure to stop and listen to the Lord so that your life and your steps will be guided according to His will and His word. When you hear the bells ringing this Christmas, determine that you will learn how you can be more like Jesus toward those who his mercy have spurned. When you hear the bells ringing this Christmas, remember that you have been sent to a world that is lost and is dying, whose hope 
and whose joy have been spent. And when the bells fall silent after Christmas, may they still be ringing in your head to remind you we are called to be living for him whom God raised from the dead. Learn. Learn Christ. This, this idea, this term, learn Christ, was common among Christians in a, day, in a day gone by. You don't hear it used much today. In the early centuries of the Christian movement, conversion involved denying the pagan gods and entering a period of, of catechism to be instructed. The word catechism is from the Greek word kate, catechesis, uh, which means to, to study, to learn, to be taught. And you would commit yourself to an intensive study of the person and work of Jesus. We would do well to institute a habitual study of the Gospels ourselves today. It's to be feared that many people imagine that they love Jesus, but they can't tell you a whole lot about him. If I tell you I love my wife and you start asking me some things that ought to be common knowledge, I go, gee, I don't know. Well, I'm not sure. That would set up a red flag for you, as well it should. There are two primary reasons to commend to you this emphasis of learning Jesus. One is that there's a devotional value to this. You grow closer to Jesus. You cultivate an intimacy with God because you can't be near to God unless you come to Him through Jesus. You will cultivate a keenness to, to hear and follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit because again, you're deaf to the Spirit unless you encounter Him through the person and work the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. The Word becomes more precious as you draw near to Jesus because He loved the Word of God. He said not one jot or tittle will fall from the Word until everything has been fulfilled. You learn Jesus. You learn His teachings, His, his Word, his, his works. There's another reason, though, to do this. And it's, it's not primarily devotional. It's more missional. And we've used this term through the years here, to be missional. The word, remember, mission comes from the Latin word missio, which simply means sent. We need to know him, what he stood for, what he lived for, what he died for, what he said constitutes doing the will of God, what he said constitutes sin. We need to know him that way if we're going to share him with a culture that basically doesn't pay any attention to him except around this time of year and even more and more resents the insertion of a baby in a manger as offensive and intrusive. I, I'm all the way from amused to dismayed at the things you hear coming out of people's mouths today. I don't know how many of you watch the Hallmark Channel. Uh, my wife is, is just inundated in the Hallmark Channel at Christmas time. In fact, I, I said, I'm, I wonder, so I, I, I said, how many, how many Christmas movies are there in the Hallmark Channel? 45. 45. This year. But now the, the report has come out that people are offended at the Hallmark Channel because their Christmas movies are too white. Offended at nativities because the, the idea of this child in a manger being the Son of God offends the sensibilities of a progressive culture. Now, folks, that's the world you and I live in. 
We better know Jesus. Because people you're going to talk to already hate him for what he stands for, what they think he stands for. So learn Jesus. And you understand, of course, that these devotional and, and missional aspects of life intersect. You don't separate them. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at living scent, the S in bells. In these days, we're rejoicing, we're singing hymns, songs about God sending Jesus to the world to save sinners. We too must take that message. And so we must learn Jesus. So when you look at our text today, Paul is talking here about, about the values of life. Uh, he, he says, we didn't print this up for you, but he says, if anybody has reason to boast in their, their background, their pedigree, I have reason for confidence also. Look at verse 4. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. So you trace his tribal roots back to Benjamin. Benjamin was the tribe out of which Saul, the first king, came. Probably our Saul was named after Israel's first king. A Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, that is, I had, I had to I memorize the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, you know, so how zealous I was for, for the name of God. I was taking my time traveling around, rounding up these followers of the way and having them stoned to death or put in prison. To righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ when he was in, encountered by Jesus on the Damascus Road. And then we pick up our text. I count everything as loss. I'm, I'm willing to, to say my pedigree, in fact, he says it here. We, the the, new, the uh, ESV cleans it up and says rubbish. That's not what Paul said. <laughs> Paul said, I count all of these things that I could appeal to to convince you of my zeal, my righteousness, my my credentials, my legitimacy, I count it all as dung. As dung. Here's why. I want to be found in Christ. When I was once trying to find those who followed Christ and put them to death, I want to be found in Christ. Not imagining that anything I have listed to you that I once appealed to as my pedigree, not imagining, to, not imagining that any of that promotes or establishes righteousness in me before God. We could do it this way. I was a preacher for X number of years. I was a Sunday school teacher for so many years. I was a deacon. I did this. I was, a, I was an usher. I, on and 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 it says, no, it's a, none of that. None of that. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, if he really goes into this in Romans, if you're familiar with Romans, that depends upon faith. It's impossible to be made right with God apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ and our childlike, simple, singularly focused faith in Jesus. And then he gets to the crux of the matter, that I may know him. Think about that. This is the fellow who wrote half the New Testament. Now, if Paul didn't know him, who does? That's not what he's, he's not saying. I want to be familiar with him. I want to be acquainted with him. I want to have some basic facts about him. No, I want to know him. It's a word used, if you go back to Genesis, we see Adam and Eve, God created them, and Adam knew his wife, Eve. God says through the prophet Amos, of you only have I known from all the peoples of the earth. Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount that there will be a day come when many will say, but Lord, didn't I do this in your name? In fact, the 
Greek of Matthew 7 is very, in your name I did this. In your name I did this. I didn't do it for any other reason. Your name was, Jesus will say, I will say to them, depart from me, you who act as if there is no law. I never knew you. Jesus knows everything. So Paul wants to know him. One, I think it was F.F. F. Bruce in a, in a commentary said this was Paul's magnificent obsession to know him. To know the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in such a way that the power that brought Jesus from the dead is the power that, that not only brought me from death to life spiritually, but the power that works in me as, as I become what Paul calls in Romans 8, an overcomer. In all these things, we are, we are super conquerors, that's the word. I want to share in his sufferings. Paul did not imagine he could add anything to the death of Christ. But he does say, as he writes, that to fill up for you what is lacking. What he meant by that was if, 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 the, if the idea of Jesus dying on the cross is, is just to you an idea because you weren't, you weren't there, you didn't see the gruesomeness of it, you didn't see the resurrection, then I want you to watch my life. I want my life to, to objectify. I want my life to flesh out. I want my life to be, to be a physical testimony to the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And when you read about what he endured, you beaten, stoned to death. I'm convinced he was stoned to death and was brought back to life. Shipwrecked, snake bit, imprisoned, deprived. I want to share in his sufferings. I want to become like, like him in his death. I want to, when I die, I want to die for God. I want to die for God. And the purpose again, in order that by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead, that, when, that, that, that I will live in such a way that when I die, there will not be question marks as to where I go. You've attended funerals. I've participated in funerals where you wondered. You wondered. Every funeral I preach, I challenge people who were there in attendance, the ones who were living to say, you know, you live long enough, Jesus tarries is coming, you're going to be in the same spot one day. Your body's going to be in a casket or some, in some form of, of, of death. And I pray that you and I will so live for Christ while we live that when we come to die, people won't have to wonder. I usually say it this way, that you will... As difficult as it may be for the, for the minister, you will have made his job a little easier because you died, so obviously died in Christ. Learning Christ. Jesus challenges that in the, in the responsive reading that we had a while ago in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Learn from me. You can't learn from Christ if you're not yoked to Christ. It will be, a, it'll be kind of a casual study, an occasional contemplation. But to yoke with Christ under His Lordship so that if you're yoked up as oxen, that when Jesus goes this way, you don't say, well, I'm, I'm going to stay here. Oxen don't do that. That's bad news for oxen. You'll shut down an oxen team if they're not yoked and moving together. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And he goes in and says, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. See, the devil is a harsh taskmaster. He promises you pleasure and gives you pain. He dangles out things that you think you desire, and, and if indeed you lay hold of them, they're so empty. I promise you this. This Christmas, a week from tomorrow, all over the world, mostly in the West. Children and some adults will open gifts, be immediately apparently thrilled. Some will not. Some will be obviously disappointed. Immediately apparently thrilled. And then the thrill is gone. Doesn't last. 
doesn't last. That's what, the, that's what the devil offers. The pleasures of sin for a season, the Scripture describes it. But if you're yoked to Jesus, if He is your Lord, you're not just counting on His death and resurrection to, to save you from hell and for heaven, but you're yoked to Him. You want to know Him. You want to be like Him. You want people, when you encounter them, to take note of you, as was said in the Scripture, to take note that they had been with Jesus. Jesus says you'll find rest, real rest for your souls. C.S. Lewis says this, In the same way the church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Christ, to make them little Christ. And by the way, that's the word, Christ Christianos. The disciples were first called Christianoi at Antioch. These little Christs. To make them little Christs. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. It is even doubtful, you know, whether the whole universe was created for any other purpose. It says in the Bible that the whole universe was made for Christ, that everything is to be gathered together in Him. When you stop and think about if you're saved here, why the Lord lets you hang around after He saved you, it's for this. To learn Christ and to reflect Him to a culture that needs Him. So we need to learn Christ. Helps us understand Jesus better. Provides the tools we need for appropriating his example into our lives. One of the most dangerous things that could ever come out of the mouth of a professing Christian is, well, I know the Bible says that, but it's damning. One writer said this, I found this interesting. He says, what did Jesus say? It's the wrong question for Christian thought. Just as what would Jesus do, as, as, as sincere, well-meaning as that is, is the wrong question for Christian ethics. What would Jesus want me or us to think, be, and do here and now, he suggests, is the right question. What would Jesus want me, what would Jesus want us to think, be, and do here and now? It's a dangerous thing to have a passing knowledge of the gospel, just a certain, a few certain tidbits. Jesus' birth, his death, his resurrection, a few miracles, a couple of the parables. You'll never learn Jesus that way. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is a great entry point, but what did he say in the Great Commission? As you go, make disciples of the nation. Make students, students of the people groups. According to what we heard earlier in Martania, there are 14 people groups who need students of Jesus Christ cultivated brought into a relationship with him. Make students of the people groups, teaching them to practice, to do all the things I've commanded you. Think about that for a minute. Do you think he said that to the disciples saying, now look, it's not important for you guys to practice all the things I've commanded you, but you need to teach others. No, no, they, they, that's, that's the thing. Leaders in churches, leaders in homes need to realize there's a hypocrisy if we're not earnestly engaging to practice, to endeavor to do the things that Christ has commanded us, then we are, we are hollow voices. Challenging people with an expectation we don't ourselves embrace. Living an incarnational mission.
Let me suggest some things that we might do to learn Christ. Study the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. Written from different perspectives. Read them, reread them, and reread them again. Not exclusively the Gospels. We ought to have a Bible reading program for our lives that we, where we cover all of Scripture. But within that ought to be a purposing to read, reread, and reread the life testimony of Jesus Christ. If you have access to a harmony of the Gospels, a side-by-side, -side, four-column arrangement where there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read those together. Read through them. Read through the Gospels in one sitting, about 90 minutes to read through Mark. John takes about two hours. Matthew and Luke, about two and a half hours each. So just challenge yourself this coming year. One of the things I'm going to do, God being my helper, is I'm going to read through the Gospel of Mark in one sitting. 90 minutes. You give more than that much time to a football game, basketball game, Hallmark movie. Read through the Gospel of Mark, 90 minutes. And when you see the benefits you derive from that, they say, well, I'm, this is, well, this was helpful. Then tackle John, two hours. Just purpose along to, if I'm going to learn Jesus Christ, I dare not go from memory only. I need to go from fresh encounters with him. Study the Gospels. Study the harmony of the Gospels. Fascinating things happen when you do that. You see these passages, whole passages that are verbatim alike. And you see how one emphasizes something, one, one inserts part of a, a narrative that the other leaves out, and you get the whole picture. Read about Jesus. There's some great uh, books have been written by great men of God about Jesus. The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur, I would commend. If you've read it, read it again. Jesus According to the Scriptures by Daryl Bach, Bach. Jesus in the Gospels by Craig Blomberg. And then Tim Keller, if you're familiar with the ministry of Tim Keller, his book King's Cross. Read about Jesus. And then, with, 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 a, with a caveat, we be careful here, because there's a lot of movies out, but I would commend to you uh, the story Jesus, uh, originally put out by the, uh, by, I think they call themselves the Genesis Project. They sold it to Campus Crusade, and Campus Crusade has the rights it was based upon the Gospel of Luke. It's one of the most accurate portrayals of Jesus with only one or two small exceptions. The only dialogue from Jesus in that comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's tremendously helpful. I have friends that get concerned about people watching Jesus because we're not supposed to recreate a visual image of him. And I understand that and I appreciate that. But folks, he had a face, he had hands, he had feet, he had eyes, he had a nose, he had two ears. I mean, he was flesh and blood, and, and so don't, I don't think you're going to be ensnared. But find some accurate portrayals. Just saturate yourself with the person and the work of Jesus Christ. One writer said this, we need to marinate our minds and souls in the story of Jesus. And I think it was the author of the book, Surprise the World, that we've commended to you that's really this, this whole series, the, the acrostic is based on that book, told a story. I thought this was fascinating. He said he was teaching a group of, of evangelists, Christian evangelists in Australia one time who were surfers. So he asked him, he said, who's your hero? And the room just erupted. 
They started talking about this, this Kelly Slater. Now, I don't, I'm not a surfer, I don't know surfing, but apparently he's really well known, a lot of awards, a lot of, a lot of medals, a lot of appearances and movies as a surfer. And they talked and, and he said, what can you tell me about him? And they just, he said, listen, he said this, when I asked a room full of keen surfers to name their surfing hero, the room erupts. And I said, okay, what do you know about Kelly Slater? He said, this time the room didn't just erupt, it combusted. When I asked a bunch of surfers to tell me what they knew about undoubtedly the most successful surfer in all of history, they went nuts, yelling and screaming facts about Slater's life and so on and so forth. Later on in the teaching, he said, well, tell me what, these are evangelists. These, these are there for an evangelistic training time. Tell me what do you all know about Jesus? Different reaction. One or two would share this or that, but not at all. The eruptive, combustible approach to the life of Jesus. I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters. If folks don't think Jesus means much to us, don't expect him to mean much to them. Those are just reality. You say, well, but he's, but he's everything to me. Well, wonderful. Thank the Lord for that. But if people don't think that, then he won't mean much to them. I asked them why they didn't speak about Jesus in the same way that they had just been telling me about Kelly Slater. Again, crickets. Silence. And that's part of our challenge. Well, I've got some scriptures here. But I wanted to share, and we're out of time. Let me give you this passage. I want you to read these when you get home. What does Jesus say about being more like himself? Look at John 13, 13 to 17. John 15, 1 to 8. John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's John 14, 15. Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to do? The Apostle John, look at 1 John 2, 6, 1 John 3, 7. Paul, the Apostle of the heart set free, who wanted to know him. Ephesians 4, 22 and 24. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Romans 6, 4. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, that it, what would God have you to do. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13, the love chapter. You, you realize when you read 1 Corinthians 13 that you're reading about Jesus, don't you? What love does, what love never does. It is, it is drawn from the life of Jesus. It's not how love feels, it's what love does. What love thinks. Titus 3, 1 to 2. Then Peter, 2 Peter 1, 5 to 9. See, all Jesus had some things to say about what it looked like to know him. And his followers who wrote in the New Testament also said some things about what it looks like to know him. Learn Christ. Whatever you know, whatever you're an expert at, purpose that you will never let anything else master you more than learning Jesus Christ masters you. Because everything else you and I know will fall by the wayside when we die. But entering into the presence of the Savior will be something that will happen forever and ever. And we'll discover, by the way, that all we thought, all we knew, all we loved about Jesus will simply intensify and magnify for all of eternity as we are gripped in a way that we cannot be gripped now with his worthiness his worthiness does Jesus fill your radar screen does he fill the screen of your life you can't afford to have him over in a corner a thimble full of Jesus won't get you anything but a hotter hell.
People will live and die on this planet and never hear a word about him whose hell will not be as intense as the hell that awaits people who knew about him and dismissed him. My prayer to you is that you will so saturate yourself in the, in the person and work of Jesus Christ that you'll encounter people who need him and gladly share out of the overflow of who he is, what he came to do, and how that has changed and transformed your life never to be the same. He was the babe of Bethlehem's manger, but he's not now. He was meek and lowly in heart, but he's not now. When he comes back, he's coming back as the rider on a white horse with, with his garments dripped in blood. King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, please, if you don't know him, come to know him. And if you know him, and you've gotten stale about that, stir up that appetite. To know him more. To know him more. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. What a Savior. What a wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Oh, teach us, Lord. Teach us. Use our teachers to not only prepare to teach about Jesus, but to spend the time enraptured with Him. The heads of our homes to love Him, adore Him, that it, that it just oozes out to the families. Make us more like Jesus. Conform us to the image of Your precious Son. We ask it in His name. Amen. Let's